And welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you, and very pleased to have in the studio with me Frederick M. Hess, also known as Rick. Rick, welcome to the program. Hey, pleasure to be with you. And Rick Hess is the author of Letters to a Young uh, Education Reformer. He's a resident scholar and director of education policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute, the conservative think tank. AEI.org is the website, and you can tweet him at Rick Hess 99 or at AEI. Do I have all that right? Absolutely. Okay, great. So, uh, you know, the, the, we're starting to get some results here. We, the Washington Post had this story last week about how charter schools and, and whatnot in Washington, D.C., the, the big experiment that the, the Republicans have been pushing for a decade and a half now, um, are actually underperforming public schools in, on a number of me metrics. But rather than, and, and, you know, I can cite studies showing char charter schools suck, and I'm sure you can cite studies showing charter schools are fabulous. But I think a larger question is, shouldn't public education, at least, you know, primary education, K through 12 education, shouldn't that be part of the commons? Why, why on earth do we want to turn this into an opportunity for some rich guy to make money? Yeah, I mean, so I guess it depends partly on how you think about the commons. One of the frustrating things for families and educators with a lot of traditional public school systems is just the smothering bureaucracy. 40% of a special education teacher's time is spent filling out paperwork. Families who find that a teacher is just not a good fit for their kid or that a school's disciplinary policy isn't a good fit. There's no real reason that we want them to go to war with principals and school boards if we can allow families and educators to find school communities that are a good fit for what they think will make sense for a kid. I used to run a private school. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, if somebody comes in with an IEP, you've got, you've got to follow that, and, and you've got to help organize that. And so, you know, I understand the 40 percent of the time, but that, on the other hand, before we had IEPs, you had all these kids falling through the cracks. You had kids whose needs were not being met. You had, you know, uh, you know I, don't, I, I don't think that's the defensible part of it. And beyond that, you know, your private charter schools, if some kid comes in with an IEP, they're going to have to comply with title, whatever it is, 9 or 10. Also, uh, you know, it's... it's. Yeah, no, the point's not, the point's not a problem with yeah, IEPs or individualized education plans for right. kids with special no, what needs. I'm, what, the problem's not that we're trying to meet the needs of these kids. The problem is that one of the realities that characterizes school systems and school districts is the amount of bureaucracy, paperwork, regulation box checking that has taken place over time. One of the, when you want to talk conceptually about why might we think things like charter schools or school choice programs are a good thing in terms of families and teachers, in terms of serving the public wheel, it's that it creates opportunities for folks to create schools, to organize school communities that aren't necessarily suffused with all of these frustrations. Well, I'm not generally speaking opposed to all those things. Although I said, as I said, having run a school, yeah. you know, I, you know, you, you try to meet the needs of the kids. You try to, you know, you, you do your best. Um, and 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 it wasn't a public school. It was, it was and it wasn't a charter school. It was a private private school, but um, for kids with learning disabilities specifically. But the 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 question I asked is not the question you answered. Um, the question I asked is, why should there be a profit motive in education? Because that's what I keep seeing. In fact, one of the people who I hired who replaced me when I, when I left Hunter School in New Hampshire back in 1983 um, uh, went on to, you know, ran the program for a number of years and went on to open a chain of charter schools in California, got wealthy enough to move down to Panama and buy a couple of hundred acres and turn it into a big development for people who wanted to, Americans who wanted to retire to Panama. Um, I mean, why should somebody become a millionaire simply because they're opening schools? Isn't this, shouldn't this be, the school that I was running was entirely nonprofit. So I, think we, there's, I think partly there's a definitional problem here. The va um, we can talk about for-profits in schooling, that's fine, but the vast majority of charter schools are nonprofits. The vast majority of schools who participate in voucher programs are nonprofits. They're generally religious institutions. So when we're talking about school choice, mostly the vast majority of what we're talking about is nonprofit schools and nonprofit school providers. Now, there are people making money throughout education, folks who sell buses to schools, folks who build schools, folks who provide well, so it's, 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 it, it, This is sort of the healthcare argument. I mean, so, you know. But, but so, I mean, I'm happy to talk about for profits, but I just do, th I, I think one of the things we tend to conflate is this notion that school choice suggests the profit motive is being introduced when 
that's not really what we're seeing play out in the country. I, I, I absolutely think it is. And I'm seeing for-profit schools opening. And I'm, I'm seeing them here in Washington, D.C. I'm seeing, I'm, I saw them up in New Hampshire when I was there. Um, you know, I was, I was uh, vice president of the, of the, of the school, uh, the association of, you know, provide, I forget the name of it now, the New Hampshire Group Home Association, actually, the NHGHA, um, which was schools as well as residential treatment facilities and whatnot. And uh, it's, it's like there are, there is a significant cohort of people in this, is in this business, and they are principally the ones who are buying lobbyists here in Washington, D.C., and, and juicing think tanks like yours to, to promote these ideas, and they're doing it for a buck. And, you know, would you, if you, if you think that that's so irrelevant, would you join me in saying that education should be not-for-profit, period? Because the big difference between a for-profit corporation and a not-for-profit corporation is a for-profit corporation exists virtually by law as its first definitional purpose to produce a profit. Whereas a not-for-profit corporation, its first purpose is to do whatever it was chartered to do, in this case, provide education. So the first metric is, did we provide a good education for a nonprofit? The first metric for a for-profit is, how much money did we make for our investors? Yeah, no, so, so I, I won't join you on that, because I tend to think about the role of for-profits in education differently. For-profits obviously have real risks and downsides because they want to maximize return on equity. They have an incentive to cut corners. And they have an incentive to try to recruit people to be clients, whether or not it's a good fit. But for-profits also, the flip side of those downsides is they provide real strengths. For-profits tend to search out cost efficiencies and squeeze, squeeze cost structures. So do nonprofits. I ran a nonprofit. We did everything. We, we had to pinch every penny. I mean, my principal job was raising money. Yeah, that's, so that's not been the story. Certainly, um, when, when you look across, say, the charter school sector, one of the concerns is not that they're making money. Most of these guys are nonprofits, well over 90%. One of the challenges, though, is because they're nonprofit, they have a, a lack you're, of you're, incentive. You're, to you're narrowly defining. You're you're keeping your definitions narrowly. I notice within charter schools. Oh well, I mean, uh, you know, no, no, no. I mean, let's also the, talk about the, the whole. You know, Betsy DeVos. She's not talking about charter schools. She's talking no, she's about any about... any school. Which sure. and there's all kinds of for-profit players getting into this marketplace. Well, so sure. So I mean, right. So there's also right. So that just definitionally for listeners, right? There's charter schools which are schools which have an authorizer that's approved by the they're state legislature, by the state. and they're chartered by the state. And there are uh, some of these that are for profit, but the vast majority of the 7,000, you know, well over 90% are nonprofit. There are also voucher programs that allow families to use dollars that would have paid for their child to go to the local district school, and instead to have a sum in Washington, D.C., the Opportunity Scholarship Program is seven, up to $7,500 per pupil, and they can use those to go to a private school of their choice. The vast majority of those schools are nonprofits. Most of them are religious institutions. Yeah, and well, and then you get to the old Catholic. The the Louisiana voucher program led to a large reduction of kids' reading and math scores. Fordham Institute study concluded kids in the Ohio voucher program did worse than kids in traditional public schools. You look at Washington D.C. This is I'm sure you read this uh, Erica Green's piece in the Washington Post. Uh, what a week in, a week ago, April 28th. Um, the Department of Education, Betsy DeVos's yes. own department, says, uh, the, the, this quote, students who attended a private school through the program performed worse on standardized tests than their public school counters, counterparts who did not use vouchers. Math scores among students who used the vouchers were roughly 7% lower than students who were not selected. Students who were not attending a low-performing school when they were awarded the vouchers, their scores dropped by 14.6% in reading and 18.3% in math. These schools are not working, Rick. So you know, so the last week, as you as you're right to point out, the Institute for Ed Sciences, the federal research arm, kind of the NIH for education, released a study of the D.C. scholarship students, the voucher students, and found that they performed worse in math than the control group. Now, it's also worth noting that IES has been uh, has been released a series of studies on the D.C. voucher program over time, and uh, I think this is the fifth or sixth report. I think four of the prior reports found positive results for kids in the voucher program. Graduation rates were significantly higher for students and voucher students in high schools than the control group. Um, nationally, there have been, you know, on the order of a dozen or 15 randomized control trials on school vouchers in the last 15 years. The vast majority have found positive results for the kids who participate versus the control group that did not. But look, I'm not actually arguing that these things work on these terms. I, I, just as I appreciate you saying that we can go back and forth with studies all day. My point is not that school choice is some kind of elixir, and I think it's unfortunate 
uh, when Trump administration officials give these speeches which suggest it. For me, the opportunity of school choice is it really does two things. One is it gives families and educators a chance to make sure that they can work in local schools that align with their educational vision and values. And two... Uh, uh, no, you, you, if, you're, if, if you're going to a public school, you've got a school board that is elected. You, as a parent, you can run for the school board. You can be one of the people who, who drives that school. That school is accountable to the community. If you're going to a private school, you're, 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 you know, you, they're accountable to their board of directors. Actually, I mean, I would argue that schools ought to be accountable in part to the families and students that they serve. And for instance, well, they are. Anybody can join the PTA. Anybody can run for the school board. It's not the same as being accountable. You, you, you've been on. You sat on PTAs and had schools. There's, there's accountability in public schools. There's a hell of a lot of accountability well, in public schools. Well, it right? partly depends. Look, it partly depends what kind of accountability we're talking about. You know, the, the, David Koch ran on a campaign in 1980 for vice president of the United States on ending all public education in the United States. I think there's a lot of people who are concerned that that, I mean, that's still the position basically of the Cato Institute and many of the organizations that the Kochs fund. And that that's the end game here is no more what David Koch referred to as state schools, state indoctrination schools. No more of that. Um, why not just improve our public schools? I mean, for me, part of the argument about school choice is it's a mechanism for helping to improve schools. Look, one way to but try it, to resolve... But it hasn't it, been demonstrated to work. It's been demonstrated not to work. So, so again, as you started out the segment saying, look, we can throw studies back and forth all day, I would argue... In D.C. anyway, it's, it's been demonstrated not to work. I, no, no, no. I think that's actually a, a, a mischaracterization of federally funded research. I would argue that if we laid out the IES reports on D.C. school choice, we would, you know, a reasonable person look at this and say... This is more working for more kids than not. But for me, that's not the argument for school choice. Look, there are decisions that have to be made about should schools have uniforms or not? Should, what, what, what kind of homework expectations should, should schools set? One way to resolve these issues is by having a school board come up with uniform policies for every family and every school in Washington, D.C. You know, it occurs to me it's not necessary, however, that we have every family either subscribe to school uniforms or not. We can actually allow these things to change Rick, our Rick Hess, American Enterprise Institute, AEI.org. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And you can tweet him at Rick Hess 99 Rick, thanks for dropping by. Hey, thank you much. Appreciate Great it. Great to see you. We'll be right back.